Welcome to the Semi-Interesting Podcast, where we explore some of the unique legal issues in the global semiconductor industry. My name is Nathaniel Lusak. I'm an IP attorney at the law firm of Hodgson Russ and one of your hosts. I'm Elizabeth Morris. I'm an IP attorney and director of intellectual property and products at Pure Storage in Mountain View, California, and I am one of your hosts. Today, we're talking about the Humble Word document. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office made some changes to its patent application filing requirements recently, and that has led to discussion about this trusted document format. So when I started practicing patent law, the USPTO's transition from filing by mail or filing by fax to online submissions was already underway. Admittedly, the online system was a little clunkier circa 2007 than what we have today. Nonetheless, the future was bright. And that filing process has been the same for over 15 years. You would submit a PDF until very recently. And not everyone was happy about that. To talk about these changes and the concerns raised during this transition, Elizabeth and I are joined by my colleague, John DeMeo, to discuss the new DOCX program at the USPTO. John, thanks for joining us today. You and I have talked about this at length as we've tried to come up with best practices for our clients, and I appreciate you taking the time to try to share your thoughts with our listeners. Before we dive into the background on what the USPTO has done and what they plan to do, could you give a quick introduction to yourself? Sure. You know, first off, thanks for having me. So prior to becoming an attorney, I did my technical training in chemistry. So I got a bachelor's degree from Alfred University in the middle of nowhere, Alfred, New York. And then I got my master's and doctorate in chemistry from the University of Rochester. During my PhD, I had decided I wanted to become a patent attorney. At which point I applied to law school, I got in, and uh, while in law school, I started summer associate, rather, at Hodgson Russ in 2016, and that was when I first met Nathaniel, who was my your my mentor back then, and I've been with the firm ever since, so it's approaching 10 years now. John, so great to meet you. This is our first time meeting, so I had no idea you were Nathaniel's mentee. That's really cool. I actually thought I was going to go into chemistry myself, so that's an interesting connection that we have. I actually did material science for a little bit because they told me there was more chemistry and material science engineering than there was in chemical engineering, but then I eventually was pulled to the dark side in mechanical engineering. I always tell Nathaniel that chemical engineers make money, not chemicals. <laughs> You know, where I went to school was a big material, or where I went to undergrad rather, is a big material science school because you know the big thing there is the, they have a ceramic engineering program. So a lot of my roommates in college were ceramic engineers and material scientists. Well, that's really that's really cool. It's certainly materials engineering. The classes that I ended up taking ended up being very helpful for me when I was at KLA Tencor, which is how I met Nathaniel originally because of the connection there. So going to jump into DocX. I know my firms, I've had, you know, I have a multiple outside counsel and some firms that I work with have been like, this DocX thing is no big deal, or we've been doing it for years. Like you could do it early, right? We've been doing it for years. It's totally fine. I have other firms that are like, this is the worst thing ever. We are never going to switch. There is luckily like some issue where you can continue to do PDFs for a while. And that's the only way because of X, Y, Z, right? I don't know. It seemed a little bit like a tempest in a teapot to me, but can you explain to our listeners, you know, what is the problem here? And also why, I guess, did USPTO think there was a problem? Why is the USPTO changing something that we all knew and loved and had been the same since, you know, the beginning of electronic filing back, you know, when Nathaniel and I were baby attorneys? Sure. I guess the genesis of DOCX filing really goes back to the Obama administration is when this was really first kind of being kicked around. Before we get into kind of the genesis of it, I can tell you, I think a lot of the fear has to do with patent attorneys. You know, we're all scientists, we're all engineers. And I think this is something we can all kind of identify with. Although we like new technology, we're also very resistant to change. You know, I think any person that ever went to any engineering course or any science course, if someone sat in your seat, you'd freak out and you go, that's my seat. Like, get out of my seat. That's where I sit every day. And so I, I think there's a little bit of that going on. I think people are inherently resistant to change. And there's also this idea to us on the practitioner side, what we were doing wasn't broken before. Why are we doing something new now? The USPTO had a very different opinion on that. 
a lot of this, I think, had to do with how the workflow would happen at the USPTO because they would use PDFs internally. And so we would file our PDF, right? They would receive it, convert it if necessary, OCR the document, and then convert it to DocX, and then that would go to whomever had to use it. And so I think the problem is the USPTO was not using good OCR software. This could have been one of the issues, and they were upset because they thought there were issues that were happening in translation. And so kind of the mantra that we've heard from the USPTO has always been, you know, this is what our examiners want. They want they want this. It'll be better for them. It'll be better for them. Interestingly enough, every examiner that I've spoken to about it says, we don't care. It, it doesn't matter to us. It's functional. It works. So that's the genesis essentially is for them, they want to change the workflow because essentially what we're doing now, if you file a docx, you upload your file, it gets converted, they prepare their own PDF from your docx and that's what gets disseminated to the examiner. Why did they do this now? As you said, I mean, it wasn't broken. Why fix it? And what was pushing the director in order to make this change and I asked that question, it's somewhat a loaded question because the rollout has been delayed repeatedly. I think a lot of it is it's because it's the government, which is probably an unfortunate answer. But I mean, anytime they project they're going to do it, it just takes longer than they expect, right? And I think the USPTO is always rather optimistic with the deadlines they set on things Mm -hmm. and they want to do something sooner than they can. And then when it gets time to actually release the product, they feel as though it's not ready. I think a lot of the initial concerns that people had several years ago were very real concerns and there were issues. You would upload documents, there'd be error, it didn't there'd be errors, it didn't know how to handle it. So I don't think it worked initially, right? Or it worked as well as the USPT wanted it to. So you'd get to the day before it was supposed to become the live moment where, you know, stakeholders would start to have to pay the fee and they delay it for another six months. I think the initial kickoff date was supposed to be, I want to say 2021, maybe 2022, and it was delayed until 2024 this year. So do you think they're actually going to let it loose tomorrow? And surprisingly, you know, we all get the email from the USPTO saying, you know, the fee to file a PDF rather than a DocX is now live. You know, we all had the same fear when they were going to sunset EFS and pair. It was the same thing, you know. When er, earlier this year, it might have been the tail end of last year when they finally, you know, closed both platforms. We're like, are they actually going to do this? I think the reason for that was more. I think they're switching over to Chromium-based systems, and that is not what EFS or Pair were. They weren't Chromium-based systems, and so on their end, right, the impetus to do this is they believe it will make everything easier for. The USPTO. And part of me, wonder, the conspiratorial side of me wonders, are they just going to start like using this as an excuse to cutting down the publications review team because fewer people have to review these documents because everything's being automated? You know, when you go to the USPTOs, they have a splash page for this now. And the benefits they list are increased efficiencies, higher data quality, smarter interface, application management, privacy, improved application quality, ease of use, and compatibility. That's their push for it. But they're, you know, as Elizabeth pointed out, a lot of practitioners that are uneasy with this. There are several that have been, you know, having webinars and 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 posts saying why this is a scary thing. And there are certainly things that are scary about it, but it's also unfortunately it's the new reality, right? So it's something we have to grapple with. So, Sean, can you tell our listeners, you know, what exactly is the new procedure you know what is what is the new normal now so the new normal is they want everyone to file a docx rather than the previous you know pdf format so essentially all you have to do is when you're done drafting your patent application you save your application locally on your hard drive you log into patent center and you literally can drag and drop it into your filing window so when you log into patent center you say i i have a new submission There's a big box on the screen and you can literally drag it in there. If you don't want to drag it in there, you can click the box and you get your typical kind of Windows Explorer or Mac OS prompt and you can select the file and upload it there. 
there are, you know, if you don't want to do that and you're more uncomfortable, there still is the option to do the legacy PDF method. However, doing that comes with a cost. For large entities, it's $400. And then if you're a small entity, it's 40% of that. And if you're a micro entity, it's even smaller from there. The other nice thing that they are doing that is in response to stakeholder kickback was a lot of people were upset by the fact, you know, they would upload their DocX and then the USPTO would then convert it to a PDF. And there were a lot of initial errors where there'd be translation problems, like you'd get errant numbers brought in. And so essentially you'd be filing something that was not what you intended to file, right? So you could have an equation and randomly a one would be inserted in the equation. I think that was an error that was experienced by Carl Opadal. Extra numbers and equations are problems. Yeah. And, you know, in, in his words were like, you know, in 10 years in litigation, we're dealing with the fact that I filed a patent application that the USPTO, you know, errantly inserted the wrong number into. And now, now I'm trying to rely on, you know, bad material. You know, the other thing they've included now is the ability to include an auxiliary PDF of your document, right? So when you file, you upload your DocX rather, and you're given the option to file a PDF with it at no extra charge. And for a while, the plan with that PDF was they were going to do it for like the first six months or a year. You had the option to do it. But as of that notification from the Federal Register, they said they were doing it until further notice. And hopefully that until further notice is kind of one of those things that they just kind of keep doing indefinitely, kind of like with after final pilot consideration program. It's supposed to sunset every year, but then three days before it expires, like we're renewing it for another year. Congratulations. And so now it's a matter of dragging and dropping. And if you don't want to do it, you can still file your PDF and you know split your document accordingly and then pay the required surcharge. That being said, one of the features that I actually really like about the new system, not to kind of say, oh, it's great, because you know, there are issues with it, but everyone I think can identify with the problem. You know, you'd upload your PDF, right? And then you have to split your document and say, okay, this many pages are specification, this many pages are claims, this many pages are abstract. And I'm a chemist by training and I did organic chemistry because I didn't like counting, right? I only ever had to count to four because carbon would have four bonds and I still have that many fingers. And so oftentimes I'm doing the math in my head to make sure that, okay, like, do I have nine pages of claims? Do I have seven pages of claims? Whenever you upload the DocX, it looks for headers in your document and will automatically segregate it into the appropriate category. So it's okay, these pages are spec, these pages are claims, this page is your abstract. And then it also will gives you a feedback document for any potential other issues. So that all sounds easy, convenient, modern, sleek. I mean, that that sounds amazing. You basically sold it for the USPTO on in the middle of the podcast. But you mentioned that there were risks earlier, there were errors earlier wayward numbers in the middle of the paragraphs. I know it's also had trouble with formulas and also with chemical structures. Have those been resolved? I mean, it's, do you know what the early feedback is with the newest version of the StockX conversion? Have we addressed some of the concerns that were raised earlier that caused delays on the rollout? Currently, it's fine. And, it, and this isn't like the it's fine with that picture of the dog in front of the fire. It's working, I think, but it's the USPTO, right? So it's the perennial issue of it's working now is not the same as it's always working, right? And that was always our fear after EFS went away was we at least had contingency, right? And I think we've seen even since Patent Center has become the only form in which we can interact with our file wrappers, there have been issues, Patent Center goes down. So far in, in my experience with filing, I've still been filing DocX now for about a year and a half, pretty much since the original rollout date I've been using it. And I've also been submitting my auxiliary PDFs mainly out of acceptance, I think is probably the best way to phrase it, right? You know, at some point you're going to have to do it. And I'd rather know how to do it while there's an opportunity for me to still ask questions and kind of see errors and figure out how to how to address those questions and errors rather than being in the middle of, you know, it's game time and this is the only option I have. That's a much worse situation to me is when I don't have that opportunity to figure out how to address something. It's gotten a lot better. One of the initial errors that I would routinely get, and I think this is one of the issues that everyone in our group had that was doing it, 
the system we use to keep all our files is called Mindcast, and that's kind of our database. And so when you use Mindcast, it, it gives you a document ID number at the bottom. So you kind of have this live item in the middle of your document. For whatever reason, it didn't like that live item. Anytime you'd upload it and it would say it was an error. So what I'd have to do is I'd take, you know, we'd have our document number and version number at the bottom, copy it, have to paste it in. They've recently fixed that. So that hasn't been a problem. So now there's no real manipulation I have to do to the file before I upload it. You know, when I'm done, I save it into Mindcast. I close it to make sure it's uploaded into Mindcast, reopen, save locally. I haven't seen any of those problems, but, you know, just because I haven't seen it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. The burden, and I think where a lot of people are afraid, is because the document you're uploading is not the same document that the USPTO receives. And so now there is a burden on someone to review the document that is being uploaded to ensure its accuracy. And I, I think these folks tend to be more on the engineering side than the science side. They really like using programs like LaTeX to draft applications. And LaTeX is not suitable for what I do, right? You know, I, I prefer like a standard WYSIWYG editor. And I, I think that's really what the USPTO is pushing for. They just want people to use something that's WYSIWYG rather than, and you guys know what I mean by WYSIWYG, right? What you see is what you get, right? It's a term when you're talking about word processors. You know, the formatting's there. When you use something like LaTeX, the formatting isn't there until you produce your document. And there are some practitioners who prefer using that. I'm not one of them. I'm also probably not smart enough to be able to use LaTeX, to be brutally honest. I understand Word. Word is what I'm comfortable with. And then there's also pushback where some people don't like being told they have to use Word as opposed to any other program. I think the Apple equivalent is is pages. And so people feel they don't want to be pigeonholed into using, you know, this Microsoft product. At my company, they're trying to get us to all use Google Docs, which uh, actually has really some good uses for interacting with inventors. So some of my OCs use it during the kind of drafting process, especially with the inventors that, you know, have a lot of feedback. And then I'm just thinking about these poor attorneys, right? So then I guess they have to convert it to Word and make a docx. And then there's this PDF aspect, right? Which everybody used to do back in the day. And now it just sounds to me like it's an extra step. I mean, maybe you can talk a little bit more about like, how do you file this back at PDF? And then does it stay forever as a, oh, I didn't catch that there was this random number pushed into my formula and I want to fix it during litigation? Or you know, what are the risks there as well, John? Sure. So it, it used to be, and I think Elizabeth, you kind of hit the nail on the head. There was an initial fear where you had the auxiliary PDF was not retained for a substantial amount of time. And there are a lot of attorneys on the various message boards on Reddit, on the listserv, you'd see people kind of panicking about document retention. And this was always kind of a foreign concept to me because we keep everything in perpetuity. But they they did change this several months ago where, and I'm going to quote exactly what is written in the Federal Register. In view of stakeholder requests, the USPTO will now keep copies of applicant-generated PDF as a part of the permanent record, regardless of whether a petition is filed. For example, for granted patents, the USPTO will keep copies of the applicant-generated PDF for at least 25 years after the patent grants before transferring it to National Archives and Records Administration. Further, with the changes detailed above, patent applicants choosing to submit an applicant-generated PDF with the validated docx files when filing an application in Patent Center will have an ongoing safeguard should any unexpected conversion discrepancies occur during the filing process. I think the current issue is that people are not sure what the Federal Register means by ongoing safeguard, how long is ongoing. I'm, I suppose, satiated by the fact that this is at least being retained for an extended period of time. I mean, I'm of the mindset, and and perhaps it's because I'm neurotic, but whenever I would file a docx, you know, you get a feedback document that tells you, okay, this is, you know, you've got a numbering issue here, or you have, you know, this is the section that reflects the claims. This is the abstract. This is the spec. I save my feedback document after I file something as well. So I, I keep all those things anyway, and then they get uploaded into file site. And, you know, like this is my own opinion and not necessarily the opinion of Hodgson Russ. But I think if you're going to file DocX, the legwork to then produce a PDF from your DocX is so minimal that you should just do it. You know, I save my DocX locally. 
I print to PDF. And then it's just a matter of dragging and dropping both documents into patent center. So it's not like there's this big hurdle that you have to jump through to do it. And one thing that I don't think we necessarily addressed is that DOCX is only really a requirement for 111A applications, right? And so for everyone that's not like a statute buff, that's only non-provisional applications. So this means provisionals are not DOCX. PCTs are certainly not DOCX. 371 applications, so national stage applications are not DOCX, just your non-provisional. That being said, when you file like a continuation or a divisional off of 371, that would be DOCX. But you're kind of dealing with the same issues that you would otherwise deal with. Like, let's say you filed your PCT prior to the switch over from ST25 to ST26 and you had a sequence listing, right? When you file that 371, you can keep the ST25 sequence listing. But if you were to file a con or a div after that, you would have to comply with the new rule and update your ST25 to an ST26, which is, I know, not the focus of this podcast, but it, I think it's just an interesting thing. Well, everyone can go take a look at it, dive deep into the statutes to uh, to double check you on that. But switching back to the burden with the backup copy. So you upload the backup copy. It seems like the burden is now on you, the practitioner, or you, the applicant, in order to verify that this was converted from your DOCX to what the PTO is using. The burden's on you to make sure it's correct. How does that process work? How would you raise an issue that you spot that there is a stray number in the middle of your formula? It's a petition from everything that I've read, unfortunately, or fortunately rather, I haven't had to do that yet. So I don't have the working knowledge to say this is how you would do it. But from everything I've read in the federal register, you know, it's a matter of filing the petition and going through it that way. And it looks like with what they're calling the ongoing safeguard, where they're kind of keeping your auxiliary PDF on file for, you know, 25 years, you know, I presume, you know, if you had an issued patent and you caught the mistake, it would be the same thing as filing your standard certificate of correction whenever the USPTO makes an error. You know, unfortunately, they do make errors, right? I, you know, at least several times a year, we're filing certificates of correction based on USPTO printing errors where they've, at least on my end, they've added an extra carbon into a chemical structure. And you're like, oh gosh, that's not supposed to be there. That's really scary. Or they've like duplicated entire claims. I had one where they didn't include the chemical structure. That one was kind of unusual, but you know, you just use a certificate of correction. And my gut tells me in the case of an issued patent, it would be the same thing. But within the case of filing you know, within the pendency of the application rights when you're still in active prosecution, just it's going to be a petition. The question is, and I, I don't have an answer for this, is how long will it take for the USPTO to actually act on that petition? I think it depends on the backup at the petitions office. If it's not too backed up, hopefully you hear quickly. Otherwise, you you could be waiting a while, which is, you know, unfortunate. I know Carl Opedal, to kind of bring up Carl again, has sent a letter over to the folks at the USPTO requesting an update about what does ongoing safeguard mean. And as of his post about a week ago, he hadn't heard back, but he did speak to the person on the phone and the person on the phone said, you do have a letter coming from me, but it's coming via USPS. So Carl, if anyone checks his blog, will have an update as to at least what the USPTO's stance is on the ongoing safeguard. So John, before I went to law school, I was a clerk at a law firm. And one of the jobs that I had was actually to take the physical documents down to the post office and get them date stamps, you know, for that day prior to, you know, going home. Actually, the other people in the office would try to get me like one filing per day because if I had to take to the post office, then I got to like catch an earlier train home. So it was like a bonus for me. Can people still file in paper? And then sort of second question, I guess, is so since there seems to be this PDF option and it seems to be in perpetuity, why would anyone not like DOCS and PDF? Like, why would you like say, no, I really want to spend $400 and like only, I mean, I understand like what you're saying about petitions sometimes being slow to be responded to if there are issues, but those are some questions I have. Like one, could you just go back to filing in paper and two... Why would people be so mad that they would refuse to DOCX at all? That's a good question. I know you can still file on paper. I've had to file on paper. And I think last time I did it was 2018. There was a two-week you know, EFS outage. And 
I had a PCT due the first day of the outage. So I was like scrambling to the post office to get a barrel stamp. I don't know off the top of my head, and I'd have to check whether or not the surcharge is only if you're filing electronically versus paper. My gut tells me you would probably still have to deal with some sort of surcharge because I think you have an additional surcharge if you're not filing electronically anyway. And I don't know whether or not you would pay both fees, surcharges, or just the one. That I, I, I unfortunately don't have the answer to off the top of my head. But you can still file by paper. That's not going away, which is good because we need, you know, unfortunately, all practitioners should really be aware of how to do this in the event patent center goes down because it's a website. It can and it will go down at some point. And I, I think everyone should know when does their local post office close? How do I do this? How many copies of my application do I need? Which type of mail am I sending this by to, to make sure you're afforded your mailing date? Which form do I need for my certificate of mailing? Which stamp can I force the unfortunate postal worker to put on my receipt? You know, do I have a postcard? Like all those rules, those, those still exist. You know, it's a great question. I just hadn't thought of it as to do you pay both or just the one non, you know, non electronic surcharge? And it's, it's the government. So I can, I, my gut tells me probably both, but I, I'd have to dig in a little bit to give you a better answer on that. I forgot what was the other part of the question. It was, okay, so there is this PDF backup option. So for practitioners that are worried, couldn't you docx and then PDF backup and save yourself $400, right? Like the only reason you're paying this surcharge is if you absolutely refuse to docx at all. Is that just because like you don't have a license? Like, like why would you, why would you not do it? That I don't know. I think there's probably a cohort of practitioners that just don't want to use Microsoft Word. That could certainly be a thing. They don't want to do anything in DocX, right? And so that's the hurdle because then they have to produce something in DocX as opposed to just doing the PDF, especially if you're doing something in LaTeX, not having ever used LaTeX. I, I don't think you can output to a DocX when you're done. I don't think you, I think you only can go into what I'll call the human readable version that it goes to PDF, right? So that could potentially be an issue I don't know if I could really think of another compelling reason not to file with an auxiliary. I think there are going to be some clients and, and some applicants that are so they it might just end up being cheaper to file legacy PDF and avoid DocX entirely than to worry about any sort of potential issue that comes up or you know mistranslation issue that comes up from you know the USPTO converting their DocX to PDF because. Some people may just view it as it will inherently be cheaper. So let's say I've got a long application. My attorney is going to review word by word that docx. Let's say that attorney takes two hours to do it. And in a lot of situations, $400 is cheaper than two hours of attorney time. And I, I think that could be a compelling reason to not use docx, at least from the client side. From the practitioner side, it's working now. Unfortunately, this is the reality. I mean, I think you know stakeholders you know, what the USPTO refers to us as and then clients and applicants can continue to raise their frustration about the issue, but I don't think it's ever going to stop. If it's ever going to go away, right? So either we, and, and maybe this is just my outlook on life, that this is the hand we're dealt, so we have to make the best of it so that, you know, we just accept it, right? Because that this is the reality. Or we continue to ignore it and, you know, pay the surcharge. But I think ultimately at the end of the day, it's a question that practitioners should pose to their clients and let them know, you know, here's the change, here are the potential issues. If you'd like, you know, we can spend the time to review the document after we upload it to make sure there are no errors. Alternatively, we could file this as a as a PDF, pay an extra surcharge, and that's the end of it. Or we don't do anything. It, it's up to the client. Um, that way, I, I think everyone understands, you know, what the risks are associated with one route versus the other. I mean, couldn't you ask your um, client here, I guess, right? So couldn't I say, like, file the docx, file the PDF, don't read it, don't charge me that time. And in the unlikely case that there's some issue, because the USPTO has said that they're going to keep these PDFs for 25 years, which is longer than the life of the patent, if I ever want to litigate this and then I figure out that there's this issue 
could I solve it then as a petition to fix? Or once the case issues, are, is there a different procedure or a concern? I mean, I understand this is kind of a new system, so maybe that just hasn't even been tested yet. But like, what if I find an issue 10 years down the road, you know, when I'm really at the point where I'm wanting to enforce this patent and now I figure out, oh, you know, way back when I was too cheap to pay an attorney to review the upload, there it missed a page altogether and no one ever noticed. And it's that, you know, part of the specification that I'm like most concerned about. Sure. I don't believe it's been tested yet because at least when all these things were originally kind of thrown out in 2022, 2023, it used to be was if your patent issued within a year of filing, I think is what I read. And that is an insane timeline. So hopefully you can still do it. And this is something that I've been kind of digging through and trying to find answers to that I've spent, unfortunately, more time reading the Federal Register than I'd care to admit, because they keep changing what they're doing. And it, it it's changed every single time they've delayed this for six months. And part of it is they want to also argue this is part of the, you know, Paperwork Reduction Act as well, and, and all this. So there's a lot of, I think, uncertainty, and I think that's where you know the other aspect of issues that practitioners are having is is that uncertainty. What do I do? And so people have been, lack of a better term, raising hell to the USPTO about it and demanding some sort of response. And I think you know that thing that I read earlier from the Federal Register. To me, the way I'm interpreting that. It sounds like you have longer to correct the record than just that single year based on the fact they, they're they calling it an ongoing safeguard. I mean, how else do you interpret that, right? You know, especially if they're saying for granted patents, you know, we're keeping this for at least 25 years after the patent grant. You know, the, the argument that I would make if I was in that situation, well, why else would you keep this if not to give me something to rely on outside of that one year window? Because I think every practitioner realizes that nothing's going to happen within that first year. I'm fairly certain I'm right about I hope I'm right about that, that the patent had to grant within the first year. But I think that's what it was. Because I'm reading this from Carl Opedal's blog because he's laying out three circumstances, right? Where you've got legacy PDF docx without applicant generated PDF, docx with applicant generated PDF. So what he's saying, if you pick DOCX without applicant generated PDF, it appears there is no correction path available to the patent owner at all, except in the relatively rare case where the patent issues within one year of the application filing date, which I mean, I think rare is an understatement. I don't, unless I guess if you're filing a track one and you're trying to get final disposition within one year, but there are usually compelling reasons to file track one and of the, the patents that I file every year, I would say maybe less than 5% are track one applications, either because we can't qualify for one of the free ways to expedite prosecution or because the client doesn't want to pay the hefty fee that's associated with it. So I have one more question for you, John. Of course. I guess we should totally clarify this. I assume it's only for the you know sort of word-esque aspects of the patent, so probably not the figures, for instance, right? Figures are still PDF, yeah. You know, which means obviously the patent office is perfectly capable of receiving PDFs and dealing with them. What do you think is next? Do you think we will see a similar DOCX switch for figures or where do you think that's going to go long term? And, and other predictions too, that's just the one that came to mind. I hope not is the first response because using Word to deal with any figure is a nightmare. I personally use PowerPoint when I'm dealing with figures because it's easy. You know, you don't get locked into these random situations where the figure suddenly gets stuck half in the header and you're like, what is going on here? Like I didn't move it there or it jumps like four pages down and you're like, why is it doing this? So you're correct with the DOCX, it's only with the with the written part of the application. My gut tells me no, that they wouldn't move to this, but I mean, they have done more unusual things, so it's hard to say. But you know, it appears as though their primary reason was strictly because of OCR, right, for character recognition. And most, uh, I'm speaking for me, I, I know it's different on the engineering side. Most of my figures are actual figures. I don't have a lot of words on on a figure page except for the word figure, or you know, if it's a 371, you know, page, you know, at the top, you know, one slash ten if there are ten figures. So I don't see it going this way. 
So I think that hopefully is is that's how it's going to stay. In terms of the backup, they're being wishy washy on it because they're saying until further notice. So who knows if they're going to change it at some point? Because they could, and perhaps they will. I hope they don't. But they've also said they're going to roll this out in 2021, and here we are three years later, and they just rolled it out. So I anticipate if they do decide to do that, they will probably delay it for a while. You know, I, I think it's an important thing that they should keep, if nothing else, to make the stakeholders happy. You know, it doesn't solve the initial, a lot of the other concerns where, you know, I think I, I mentioned this before because the, the document you're uploading is not really the document that's being transmitted to the USPTO. From all like the flow charts I'm seeing, they're making one document that's being converted into another document. That docx is then being converted to a PDF, which is then being forwarded to the examiner, right? And then you've got your auxiliary PDF, which is also there in the ether as well. So that's kind of the big fear is that, well, this is what I filed. This is what document one originally was before the USPTO took it and did whatever manipulations they're going to do to it to make sure they can correctly recognize each character on the page. So hopefully they continue to do it, but they could just as easily take it away. And, and it's one of those things where I, if I was a clairvoyant, I also would not be an attorney. I'd be sitting in my mansion. But hopefully they keep it. And the office has been fairly good about giving some sort of notice about when they're going to do something. You know, in the event that they decide, you know, we're going to stop retaining these documents, I presume they would give at least six months notice and hopefully provide some sort of means by which stakeholders can fix any potential issues on the record. Hopefully the correction wouldn't just be, okay, now you have six months where you have to go through all these files that you filed docx and read all these patents you know, or patent applications line by line to make sure everything is commensurate with what you originally filed. You know, Hopefully that's not the corrective action, but you never know. Well, John, I appreciate that you are trying to use your clairvoyant skills to give us some guidance on what to expect in the future. I hope those clairvoyant skills are accurate with respect to this particular podcast subject, but not accurate outside of work because I need you to keep reviewing the Federal Register for me. I, I don't want to have to do that. That's why I have you. Yes. I mean, these are you know things that I think, frankly, practitioners should be aware of. And the USPTO has been generally pretty good about trying to make sure that everyone is aware of how to do it. They have several upcoming events for DocX training. They have a sandbox you can play in, like a training module in Patent Center that you can use. If you literally just look up, the, the URL is very easy. It's just uspto.gov slash patents slash DocX. It takes you to the splash page where they have, you know, how does the engine work? Here's an FAQ, register for a seminar. And I think they have like their 45 minute webinars on how to do this. I don't think it takes 45 minutes to do that. I mean, the, the first time I figured out how to do it, I literally just dragged the DocX into Patent Center and I was like, oh, it worked. Okay. But there are a lot of useful resources on that page. They have, you know, things about here what possible errors you, you know, you might receive. Here are some supported fonts. Here are fonts that don't work. Here are best practices. You know, it's they're they're being fairly transparent with it. And knock on wood, I have not run into any issues that I'm aware of thus far. But I think this generally is this is the the trend in patent law. Anytime there's a big decision or like a change to how we perceive things, there's a fear. Like everyone feels this fear. It's like after after Alice, there was this fear. After, you know, Myriad, there was this fear. After Mayo, there was this fear. I'm not sure what that says collectively about patent attorneys as a whole, but whether we like it or not, change is happening. Well, John, thank you so much. I certainly feel a lot less fearful about the DocX thing and the repercussions and, and the sort of safeguards that are in place. And most importantly, I learned a new word today, WYSIWYG. So I'm going to try to make sure I can put that into another sentence later on today at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's literally an acronym for what you see is what you get. I don't get to say it very often, but every time I do it, it's very exciting. Yeah, I'm, I'm already planning for how I can sneak it into conversation later on today. <laughs> thank you. It was, it was great talking to you, and I'm very excited to form other parasocial friendships with the listeners. Nathaniel is laughing, but that's how that's my general feeling with podcasts. Every time I listen to a podcast, I feel like I'm making friends with the hosts. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Semi-Interesting Podcast. You can find more episodes wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. And if you enjoyed the episode, we always appreciate five-star reviews. While we talked about legal issues, none of the information shared during this podcast is intended to be legal advice. If you have any questions about information we cover or ideas for a future episode, feel free to contact me or the other attorneys at Hodgson Russ. You can find contact information at www.hodgsonruss.com.